So I will now give the floor to the man that we will have to do a lot of work until the end of the day. Uh, I want to thank Nick uh, Rust, who is the chief executive of the BHA. Well, nobody is perfect with the Brexit, but we are working hand in hand, and that's what a good example of how racing can coordinate what, what we can, because we don't control anything, even our government. But at least it's a great pleasure to have the tripartite countries, Ireland, England, and France, working hand in hand to reduce the damage of the situation. And anyway, there will be no way to reduce the damage this afternoon. You have the floor, and I want to thank you for having uh, organized with the BHA this uh, session. Thank you, Nick. And you can give him a round of applause before. Well, thank you very much, Louis. Uh, good afternoon, bon après-midi um, to all of you here. Um, just like to, to add my thanks to those of Brian earlier for um, a fantastic day at Longchamp yesterday. Um, I thought the day worked really well. Um, only one thing went wrong, obviously. Um, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take some views on that later on, I'm sure. But thank you very much. And also to add my thanks to Andrew Chesser and his team for organizing this extensive session this afternoon on welfare. Uh, and congratulations to Wald Geist and André Fabre for the tremendous victory yesterday. This afternoon's time on welfare um, is a really important session, I think. Uh, we've got a few hours at it. I'm very excited about the contributors in our three sessions this afternoon, which we're going to explore the cur current environment and the future of welfare. It feels like a momentous time for the topic we're discussing, and we have a chance to inspire and galvanize real momentum and cooperation across world racing in dealing with what I believe is the biggest challenge for our sport. We were due to have our keynote speaker with us, um, but such is the nature of British politics at the moment. She has been detained in London uh, and uh, is busy dealing with the latest iteration of, uh, of Brexit, I'm afraid. However, if I can please uh, introduce Tracy Crouch, who's going to appear on a short video to give you her address. She's a British Member of Parliament. She was Sports Minister in the UK from 2015 to 2018, during which time, with some assistance also from another big supporter of horse racing, Matt Hancock MP, she oversaw the introduction of our new horse race betting levy legislation which is one of the key funding sources for horse racing in Great Britain, capturing offshore betting activity for the first time. And she's also now an independent member of our new Horse Welfare Board. She's going to speak for about four or five minutes. Good afternoon. I'm sorry that I cannot be with you today due to British parliamentary business. However, thanks to technology, I am delighted to still be able to open this session discussing horse welfare and I commend Nick Rust of the BHA and the IFHA for organising it. In over three years as the UK Sports Minister, I was proud to have responsibility for our world-leading horse racing industry. Globally, horse racing provides employment to tens of thousands of people, entertains millions on race courses, and generates billions for the economies worldwide. It is deeply rooted in the social and cultural fabric of many countries and it is an asset for poly policy makers and governments worldwide. However, today norms are being challenged and societal expectations are evolving faster than ever before. Horse racing's leaders must be alive to that revolution and how it impacts the attitudes of policy makers. Nowhere is that societal change demonstrated more than attitudes to animal welfare including farming practices, transportation, wild animals in circumstances, and of course the use of animals in sport. I have personally championed animal welfare campaigns with political resonance, including opposition to trophy hunting, fox hunting, and the badger collar in the UK. In many countries, horse racing has a social license to operate. This is commonly understood to mean acceptance of industry practices and procedures by the general public. That licence is granted in return for horse racing understanding and demonstrating its duty of care for the horses it breeds and races. If horse racing fails in this, that licence can easily be revoked. 
my mailbag as a politician is often the best barometer of attitudes. Increasingly, animal rights organisations and their supporters are filling that mailbag with concerns about horse welfare, including racing and especially around major events. Horse racing industries around the world need to be prepared to respond to this challenge. That is why today is such an important discussion to which I would like to offer just a few thoughts as a policymaker. Firstly, the sport needs to be open and better communicate what it already does to ensure high standards of horse welfare. When I was sports minister, I was able to visit the fantastic veterinary stabling and anti-doping facilities at Cheltenham. Demonstrating this care and attention to as wide an audience as possible is key. That will feed through to policymakers. Secondly, a clear evidence base is required. The emotional challenges presented by opponents need countered by clear evidence of investment in equine welfare and successful outcomes. And if that evidence does not exist, then the industry has a much bigger problem. Thirdly, you must be prepared to challenge attitudes within the sport and see things from a wider perspective. This is not about appeasing opponents, but understanding how the public and politicians outside of the world of racing will perceive welfare. That's why I am delighted to have joined the Horse Welfare Board established by British Racing. It is only right that outside and challenging voices contribute to improving welfare. You either have informed debate in racing, leading to proactive and reasonable change, or have change forced upon you by policymakers distant from the intricate detail of the industry, but reactionary to public opinion. This is a turning point for the industry. It is time to embrace the welfare agenda, otherwise a generation of racegoers will be lost and an industry susceptible to decline. Much good has already been done, but there is more to do, and I'm sure this afternoon's debate will be interesting and pro productive. I'm sorry again I cannot be there, but I wish the thoroughbred racing industry every success in proving welfare for the benefit of our wonderful racehorses and an important sector to our economy. So I know that not everyone will necessarily agree with um, all of Tracy's thoughts, but it does, I think, reflect very much where certainly policymakers in, the, in Great Britain are, and we're hearing stories from around the world that suggest that um, she and our government won't be alone. Today's not about Great Britain. We will be concentrating on welfare and its perception around the world. I would just like to provide a little bit more context on Tracy, though, just before I leave that. She perhaps wouldn't mind me referring to her as something of a maverick, not least in that she, sadly, is a rare individual in being popular across our main political parties. Also, as some of you may know, while she was sports minister, she led the clampdown and restrictions on so-called fixed odds betting terminals uh, in Britain's betting shops, which I mention not because of the probable impact on our sports finances in Britain, but as an example very close to home of an industry closely aligned with ours, betting and gaming, which perhaps got the public mood wrong. Crucially, whilst in office and now on our welfare board, Tracy has been a critical friend of horse racing, acknowledging both where we have a strong track record, and there's always more to be done, of course, as we all know, and areas, including before and after horses racing careers, where there is more to be done. Governments in particular, and to varying degrees in this room, we're all reliant on their support, not to mention um, the word that um, does wind some people up, social license, will now absolutely expect governing and regulatory bodies to be focused on their duty of care to their sports participants, and for instance, to demonstrate this in expenditure priorities. So in terms of how we see this afternoon running, and at the Executive Council, we were keen to have particular focus and the sharing of ideas on this topic this year. There'll be a few more words from me now. Then we have an excellent panel who I'll introduce shortly, who will present some of their own case studies and discuss the many great improvements our sport has made on welfare over the last 20 years. Then we'll be seeking some interaction from the floor. Um, you'll notice some new technology that Louis has mentioned earlier, and we're looking forward to involving you in some polling. We want uh, a need to understand where welfare and well-being 
the challenges and opportunities sit across the IFHA membership. After a break, we'll examine how the environment in which we're all operating is changing, with facts and perspectives from Richard Heitner, whose agency Beta Baboon has been assisting British racing over the last year. We'll then conclude with a few more examples of how individual jurisdictions are addressing the current challenges and focus on the role the IFHA can and should play to support us all. So why does this subject matter? Why is it important? And uh, what do we mean when we talk of equine welfare and well-being? We all know that our sport at its best and in its iconic moments is at the heart, as at its heart, a celebration of the horse. It's our champion horses like the ones we've heard mentioned today, Trev, Winx, Enable, and Diedra, that cut through and have the ability to capture the public imagination. As a sport, as an industry, we want to be known for putting the horse first. This will be even more vital, as Richard will illustrate with his panel later on, in the age of social consumers. I would say that we do internationally face unprecedented challenges with significant opportunities as well. In Britain, at the BHA, we can sometimes be accused of being too negative or perhaps pessimistic with regards to the future of welfare and its perception, uh, and sometimes are accused of bringing some of the adversity public upon, publicly upon our sport. I, respect, I respectfully say that this is absolutely never our intention. We care deeply about our sport, are here to ensure it's sustainable in every sense of the word, and to grow in the years to come. We're here to champion as well as safeguard our reputations, help build coalitions within the sport, and partner with respected welfare organizations. There's always a role for critical friends. And whilst the situation on equine welfare and its perception in our individual countries differs, whether you're facing immediate pressure in your country from changes in consumer outlook now or not, it's pretty certain we will all need to face up to this challenge over the next few years. The climate is changing, but there are also huge positives. And now is a time for international cooperation and leadership. What do we mean by welfare and well-being? We talk a lot about welfare, and it's important, obviously. Sometimes we talk about it from a defensive position. But well-being could be very powerful in arguing the case for racing. What's the difference between the two? Well, one definition I've come across suggests that welfare is a wider term, reflecting what's expected from the environment, for example, humans towards animals, to respect the needs of an individual, animal, child, or employee. And well-being is a subjective state that is correlated with welfare, but does not relate directly. Some wealthy people experience poor well-being, and some poor individuals are happy. Sick animals experience often good care and welfare, but the well-being is, due to the sickness, quite bad. The former has the advantage that it's measurable, demonstrable, and has an objective base. The disadvantage is that the term is often used negatively to fo focus on risks. The latter better captures the benefits to horses from, bring, from, from being trained to race, richer lives, a purpose, a relationship with humans, but it's subjective and therefore arguable. That's one of the things that I'd like us to um, focus on as we go through our thread today. When we're looking at uh, welfare, we, we define four uh, main areas across the lifeline. And really, they are before training, what happens from um, the, the conception onwards, the, the intention to breed onwards, um, obviously during training, um, where horses have a racing career, um, on the race course specifically, because you need to look at things a little differently um, in, in training, out of competition and in competition. And finally, in an area that the IFHA has focused on more in recent years with the partner organization IFAR, uh, the experience after racing, which we're going to hear a bit more about during one of our panelists' presentations shortly. I'd like to finally um, uh, look at how we address risk in welfare. Um, in assessing risk, three categories have been identified in some of the thinking that the welfare group has done. 
substantive welfare risk, ethical risk, and perception risk. And these all need addressing and managing in context. I'd like to come to, to um, uh, a concept that, that we are starting to think about in Great Britain, but which needs some consideration at international level, um, I would put forward. What is our approach to managing reasonably avoidable risk? What is our approach to managing the risk to horses, and what does success look like? How do we talk to the public about what we do to minimize the potential for horses being harmed whilst taking part in our sport? I think a lot of us adopt the approach that our job as regulators is to manage these risks, but how do we explain that it's not possible to reduce risks to zero or to the levels that are sometimes suggested by well-thinking people who may not fully understand the risks to any animal or the benefits that they can experience? What risk indeed should we be trying to manage? Drawing on the words used by one of the major animal welfare charities, I'd like to put up this concept of avoiding reasonable risk. And what do I mean by that? Avoidable risks are those that we can identify and can do something about. We know we don't want items left on a racetrack. We don't want people running onto it. We don't want the stalls to malfunction. We need to ensure injuries are managed appropriately. We want the design of the course and any obstacles where we have them to be as safe as possible. And we should leave no stone unturned in looking at that. Where we identify reasonably avoidable risk, it's our duty to take action to deal with them. And we must continue to identify and deal with risk as our research and learning and technology improves. Unless we do this, in my view, we're not in a strong position to deal with the changing consumer opinions across the world. We must continue to keep our house in order and seek to mitigate as much reasonably avoidable risk as possible. I'm delighted to now introduce our four panel members who are involved in welfare and regulation across the world in California, Hong Kong, France, and Great Britain. And I'd like them to join me on the stage, please. Please welcome Dr. Rick Arthur, who's the Equine Medical Director at the California Horse Racing Board. Brant Dunshay, who's the Chief Regulatory Officer at the British Horse Racing Authority. Dr. Brian Stewart, Head of Veterinary Regulation, Welfare, and Biosecurity Policy at the Hong Kong Jockey Club and Dr. Paul-Marie Gadeau, Head of the Horses and Control Department at France Gallo. Please welcome them. Each of them is going to give a short presentation covering their perspective on welfare and some current case studies, and then we'll have some audience polling and a panel discussion. First of all, can I please welcome Dr. Rick Arthur. Well, as you'll see, I agree with Tracy Crouch that there is a uh, social license. Social ethics towards animal use has been changed dramatically in the li during the lives of everyone in this room. Horse racing must adapt to meet society's changing ethical standards or it will not survive. There is a real risk that in California, the fifth largest economy in the world, and in many ways an international trendsetter, racing could end. What Tracy Crouch would say, the social license would be revoked. The status quo is not good enough. The culture of racing must change. Horse safety and with a jockey safety must be our number one priority, even before winning. I applied the IFHA's efforts and attention to horse welfare. The IFHA's welfare committee has been working very hard the last several years. So what, is, uh, uh, so what is society not like about horse racing? There are several complaints, but the two major issues I'll address are fatal injuries and whips. Earlier this year, Dr. Peter Hitchens from the University of Melbourne published a meta-analysis of racing fatalities from around the world. Dr. Hitchens calculated that there are about 1.17 racing fatalities per 1,000 runners. Worldwide, that is a very large number of horses. Many of you in this room, and, uh, and this isn't a criticism, are a step away from the flesh and blood of these fatalities. I've been there. Many of these fatalities are ugly, very ugly. The U.S. averages roughly twice the fatality rate as non-North American racing. 
My international colleagues would like to believe that the relatively liberal medication regulation in the U.S. is to blame, and certainly we heard this morning that John Goss and Cricket Head agree. I agree permissive medication is a factor, but from my perspective, the story is more complicated than that. We predominantly race on dirt surfaces, a known race factor, and more importantly, U.S. racing uses claiming or selling races rather than handicapping to put competitive races together. The result is a culture where horses tend to be treated as commodities. Horses are commodities everywhere in the world, but the U.S. racing business model amplifies that. There's a special relationship, societal relationship with horses. The public, certainly in the U.S., simply does not consider horses to be livestock. In fact, horse slaughter is not allowed in the U.S., and selling a horse for slaughter in California is a crime. In spite of the attention uh, at Santa Anita this winter, California ended up their fiscal year on June 30th with the second lowest number of fatalities since 1990. Reducing fatalities has been a long-term trend and the result of an ongoing concerted effort to improve racing safety in California and in the U.S. And if anyone is interested in U.S. efforts, the Jockey Club Welfare and Safety Summit website is a good resource. Santa Anita should be an example to everyone how quickly an animal welfare story races out of control. We don't have time to go through the details, but simply inordinate rainfall in January and February resulted in what I'll generously uh, describe as a compromised racing and training surface. Santa Anita raced and trainers trained when they should not have. There is a, the racing press understood that there is a normal fatality rate in horse racing. The non-racing press and public did not. That is no longer the case. The public simply considers the numbers unacceptable, nevertheless the cluster of fatalities at Santa Anita in January and February. The, for anti-racing animal rights advocates, the Santa Anita racing uh, tragedy is the opportunity they've been waiting for. They are not letting up. Animal rights racing advocates are making sure the internet, print, electronic media, and elected officials are aware of each and every racing fatality. If there is any positive from this crisis, it's been the opportunity for reform. For the first time, trainers have not opposed medication restrictions. California has moved dramatically closer to IFHA standards for medication regulations and drug testing. We have instituted a 14-day stand-down for intraarticular injections, which the uh, IFHA Welfare Committee has discussed for several years. California is essentially in compliance with IFHA regulations, with the exception of Lasix, and even race day Lasix is under discussion. And starting next year, two-year-olds will not be allowed to have Lasix in California. This audience may be interested to know that race day Lasix proponents in the U.S. argue that race day Lasix is actually an animal welfare issue. That is, race day Lasix is actually beneficial to horses. The second animal rights issue is uh, touch point is whip use. In my 30 years of racetrack practice, I rarely had to attend to a whip injury. With newer cushion whips, we seldom see cuts or welts. There are those who argue that whipping doesn't hurt horses, but that's nonsense, and we all know that. Whips are noxious stimuli. They hurt. That's why they're used. Run fast or I'll hit you again. More importantly, for a sport that relies on public support, whipping simply looks abusive. The Jockey Club Safety Committee in the U.S. has taken the position that the whip should only be used for control and safety and not for encouragement. I'll let sorting out how that principle would be implemented to others, but restricting the whip use was one of the responses to the Santa Anita fatality crisis. You might be surprised to learn that whip use appears to have been a factor in three Santa Anita fatalities. In all those instances, when the injured horse started backing out, the jockeys went to the whip, whip rather than help ease the horse up. I can't say those injuries would not have been fatal, but there's no question that the whip exacerbated those injuries. Thank you for your attention, for this very brief comments on a very complex issue. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Rick. I'm sure we'll be returning to that. Um, Brent, would you like to give some reflections on data-led management? Thank you. 
Thank you, Nick. Uh, 20, 25 years ago, when I uh, commenced my career in uh, racing administration, uh, horse welfare was not uh, the priority it is today. When uh, we look at today's session and the IFHA's strategic priorities, that horse welfare is, is now uh, at the number one focus of today's session. It does really uh, help us reflect on, on where the industry has come. Last year, I uh, had, uh, was in a situation where we had uh, one of our major festivals, the Cheltenham Festival. Uh, it's, it's an iconic event, a, a cultural part of British racing uh, history. Uh, we unfortunately had um, six fatalities at that event and as a consequent, consequence, as responsible regulators, we uh, believe that there was a need to review uh, the, the, the festival and reflect on all the excellent work that had been done by the Jockey Club and Cheltenham Racecourse and the industry collectively and try and work out what we could do to learn more uh, to improve welfare outcomes for our horses. And through that process, what became evident very quickly was the importance of understanding data and understanding the significance of that data to inform uh, decision-making and policy uh, formulation uh, as our industry evolves. Jump racing is an incredibly important part of racing uh, history in Britain and, and it makes up the best part of 50% of our total product. So it is essential for us in, in Britain, Ireland and France where it is such a fundamental part of our racing culture to do everything we possibly can to understand what measures we can take to mitigate the risk uh, to our equine athletes. So uh, from the Cheltenham Review, which was published late in 2018, uh, we came up with 17 recommendations. And I won't go through them all, but what I will do is just briefly highlight the key recommendation as we saw it that came from the review. And that was the development of a jump racing predictive risk model. Now, this was not uh, new thinking. I know that the US Jockey Club have done some excellent work uh, in that area in relation to flat racing uh, and other, other um, jurisdictions around the world have also looked at this. But for us uh, what we uh, felt was relevant was to think about stepping back from the subjective uh, and all of those great uh, measures that have been put in place by uh, administrators previously and based on the recommendations of horse, horsemen and uh, jockeys and such like and people that understand race courses and take all of that information, feed it into some systems and start to understand what, what variables in combination or in isolation actually increase and decrease risk. We went to tender uh, this year um, and developed a scope for this piece of work and it was an across industry piece of work that involved uh, representatives from our race courses, from, uh, it involved horsemen and horsewomen, it involved administrators and analysts and, and, and I'm very pleased to say we've got Dr Tim Bar Parkin on board through that tender process to assist us in this work. And uh, we hope to uh, have some, some uh, tangible results from that work uh, as you can see there uh, late this year and into next year. But to give it some context, uh, what we're looking at is a wide range of variable factors and all of these different factors uh, have different uh, impacts when combined. And so we're looking at things like uh, the course, the obstacle type, the speed of the race, uh, the, the, the conditions of the ground, the distance of the event, going, field sizes, uh, the class of the races, uh, the, the, the experience of the horse, the experience of the, the, the jockeys. Uh, we've broken it down into the categories you can see on the screen there. Uh, and hopefully what we can uh, deliver from this is um, some sound evidence-based decision making to assist uh, us from a race programming perspective, uh, for race courses to uh, understand what they can do um, in addition to the great work they're already doing uh, to mitigate and reduce risk. Nick talked about the concept of, of 
um, reducing uh, avoidable risk and that, that is something we're working hard on. What I would say is uh, from this process is if I had one message for whether it's regulators or um, stakeholders in this room is data is so important to making evidence-based decisions. And I noted the first three slides at the beginning of today's um, presentation during the General Assembly, there was reference to the significance and importance of data. Now, if there's one message I could send to the industry is that we need to work together to reduce these territorial boundaries around data. Data is key to all of the decisions we make. We need that data to be able to um, engage with it, the practitioners, the trainers who can help us work with that data to make the best and most um, pragmatic decisions to mitigate risk uh, when it comes to our racing uh, product. So my one message is, uh, please, as regulators, as, as racing officials around the world, please start working together to share data. Uh, you know, welfare is so important to our sport that, uh, that the notion of, of owning data and data rights is something we have to start to think about, particularly when it comes to horse welfare and sharing that, whether it's racing regulators or uh, our training uh, community as well who need to work with us on, on in that respect. So um, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, I, I would be happy to take any uh, questions later on after the, the session uh, or during discussion on, on our work because it's actually a really exciting piece of work that we believe will deliver some tangible outcomes for us. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Brent. Um, now I'd like to invite Dr. Brian Stewart to, to come up and talk. Um, he's going to particularly focus on aftercare. Thank you, Brian. Uh, thank you, Nick, and thank you to the IFHA for this opportunity. Um, when Nick started uh, speaking to me about this, uh, this, this panel discussion, uh, one question he asked was, um, what is uh, the major change over the last 20 years or so, uh, particularly in, in perceptions of horse racing and of horse welfare? And another one he asked was, uh, what, what is uh, welfare for a racehorse? So I tried to distill that down to perhaps the, the absolute sort of minimum to the essence of, uh, of what I think has changed over the years. And, uh, and what I think welfare should be uh, thought of in terms of horse racing. So I've been in practice probably 40 years and I think when I started out and probably uh, many people here, um, the racehorse has always been an elite athlete. Um, we talked this morning about the beauty of the, of the racehorse and that's undoubtedly one of the main attractions of the, of the sport and must continue to be so. But we also had a, a sort of mindset that the horses were production animals. They were bred for a purpose. They, they raced and at the end of their career, if they went on to uh, a happy retirement, that was great. But I don't think too many of us were that concerned if, uh, if horses uh, were euthanised or, or moved on. It was just part of the, of the business. Maybe that's going back you know, 30 or 40 years. And there's been a gradual evolution uh, from that position. So now we're really uh, racehorses as well as being magnificent elite athletes um, also perhaps have the status of being a, a companion animal, um, something very special, a sporting hero, something much above livestock and, uh, and that's a pretty significant paradigm change I think and uh, something it impacts on, on everything we do and particularly it impacts on aftercare. Uh, I think horses in training are, are very well looked after. Um, there's almost a contract where, uh, you know, if you look after your animals, they look after you. It's inherent in the business. Um, nobody training or racing, apart from a few mad or bad individuals, uh, don't provide the, the absolute best they can for their, for their racehorses. So I'm reasonably comfortable where we are, with a couple of notable exceptions about the welfare of horses in training. But when we get to aftercare, things get... A little bit, uh, a little bit more problematic. So, 
next question was what's welfare? And uh, Nick uh, mentioned that earlier. And in academia, in uh, animal uh, protection groups, activists, there is this uh, thing that really providing welfare in ho animals that we use uh, for sport and for our own pleasure and recreation um, really require a higher standard of care than that fundamental uh, welfare that's mentioned there below the line. So I think racehorses get that care below the line without exception almost, except in very rare cases. But when you start to get above, and especially towards the top of the pyramid, um, things get a little bit more difficult. And, and this is what welfare groups believe we should pro be providing for our horses. Um, as I say, I think in training we do a good job. But when horses go out of, uh, go out of racing, it becomes uh, a bit more complicated. There will always be an elite group of horses that are desirable for other careers, and they'll always be easy to place. There's a middle ground that we can probably do something about to improve their attractiveness and improve their lives, but there will also be a tail end with horses that have been injured or a bad temperament or just aren't really suited for any future purpose that become a real challenge for us to manage. So the, um, the um, International Federation for the Aftercare of Racehorses has produced a, a, a document uh, just recently and I would commend it to everybody to get a copy of it and to uh, use it uh, as a tool for developing strategies for the aftercare of racehorses. It's a, a big topic and we can't do anything but really touch on the highlights of it. But they produce six strategies, six areas on which we need to focus. Um, One's the concept of lifetime management, which means before racing, during racing and after racing, each require different strategies and different procedures. And just to reinforce what Brandt was saying, um, being able to follow up on horses once they leave racing is a really important thing. When I was in Racing Victoria, uh, I faced activist groups and uh, we'd have debates and they'd produce all their figures and I'd go, yeah, but that's not right. Um, and they'd say, where's your figures? And I'd say, uh, well, um, I don't actually have any, but I know you're wrong. Um, and it was pretty lame. But since then, Racing Australia's taken the initiative and produced some excellent figures that, you know, proved I was right, but it's no good without the evidence. We need that, uh, we need that evidence coming through. So um, the second strategy refers to transitioning, which is helping horses move out of racing. Um, so um, retraining, um, quality assurance systems, trying to stimulate demand for x race horses, and there are various programs around the world that do that. Um, there is the, the safety net, which refers to those group of horses I spoke to before that either really aren't suitable for rehoming or go through multiple owners and end up in a distressed situation. Uh, another strategy just mentioned was therapy horses and community engagement. Um, it's a very good um, indicator of, uh, or uh, I guess, a promotion of the horse. Uh, I think Churchill said there's something about the outside of the horse that's good for the inside of the man, and that's very true. And I think it's one of the things about racing that I, I think is critically important for us uh, to, to realise that uh, we don't have racing, we don't interact with those uh, magnificent athletes and we're a lot poorer for that. So it's one of the, the purposes, I suppose, of why I do what I do. Uh, we also need to advocate that the thoroughbred is, in fact, a, a good um, animal for other purposes um, and, and a, an elite athlete and uh, has done very well in future careers. And we need to build international networks so that we can, we can um, learn from each other. In the Jockey Club example, the Hong Kong Jockey Club, we're in a unique situation, but we do have a, a very comprehensive uh, retraining program that um, takes on uh, you know, perhaps 150 horses a year and re-educates and retrains them. We have a system where owners pay a, a levy or subsidy when they uh, purchase a horse that goes to either repatriating the horse or into the retraining program. I guess we're in a, a luxury position 
But I do think we need, in the future, everybody needs to look at how we're going to uh, fund and provide for retired horses to do these things for facilitating them, moving on to future careers, pro providing a safety net, um, promoting the horse uh, and um, the thoroughbred horse, I mean, uh, as a desirable uh, future career horse or as a companion animal. So time's short, it's a huge topic, but um, we'll cut, leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. I'd um, now like to welcome um, Paul-Marie Gadeau, who's going to give his reflections before we go into a panel session. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. I, I can tell you that globally we take a great care of our horses. We do not, we do more for our horses and more than for the most domestic animals, accommodation, health and transport, food, the fight against do doping. And as you know, we control more horses than in the other uh, competition, even human competition. We do a lot also in retraining, retirement of horses. And uh, as you can see, we do that for a very long time. As a matter of fact, the purchasing power of our horses is greater than that of a part of humanity, even in Europe. So no shame. Welfare issue has been thoroughly dealt by the IFHC Welfare Committee in many ways now from uh, 2010. So nine years of work. And we are still targeted by activists. There are still some points that must be addressed because the, these are symbols that play against us. Clearly, it is the use of the whip. It is training and racing of two-year-old horses. And it is accident. Horsemeat and slaughter are also issue. It was a case in France at the beginning of the year. It was a case in Asia, in Korea, uh, during this year. Even if we manage to lift all these issues, the activists will ask for more because their primary objection is that we simply use animals. They promote a world where, horse, where animals enjoy the same rights as a human being. The very fact that we ride and work with horses puts them off. Accident and slaughterhouse are their argument to try to convince the public that we are essentially bad for horses. They exploit the people's sensitivity to animals and use and really use very heartly social network. The, the social network are free and easy, and they conduct campaigns which demonstrate to the rest of the population that we are not good for horses. And you can see what has been published in Twitter a few days ago about the place of racing in the system, in the Airbnb system. What should we do? It is the interesting part. We must work, work, and work. To limit risk and to protect our horses, to remove whatever could be used against us as much as we possibly can, change some of our habits. That is important. We must keep going working. But there is one solution, to occupy the media field by telling our beautiful story. And we have beautiful story. Not only those of the winning competition, but those that move the public and the people. 
the love we have for our horses, that our love carrying them, that our breeders' life every day. We must occupy the social network with beautiful stories. And it is feasible. We have those beautiful stories. This morning, Cricket Ed spoke about beautiful stories. And we can demonstrate that. Those of our horses who are happy, not because they live in a palace. A lot of them are living in a palace. But it's not interesting for people. They want to see the, the owner. They want to see the affection of the trainer, of the lad. And when the story is sad, when the horse is wounded, it is necessary to give the word to the owner in tears, to the unhappy reader, to the destroyed lad, to the vet. The war takes place now in the media space. The response must be in the media. So don't be so pessimistic. We do the job. Not all the job. We must progress. But the problem is not the level of care we bring to our horses. The problem is in the media and in front of people. And we must change the public perception on racing. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you, Paul Marie. Um, so we've heard some different views on different aspects of what we're facing at the moment, and some good news, some good stories about work that has gone on tirelessly in our sport. Um, before we go into a bit of panel discussion and a chance for some questions for you too, um, I'd like you to have a look at your, I think Louis called it, your uh, telephone present um, in front of you, please. Have a little look at that, and we're just going to ask your opinion on a few things. Um, our friends are uh, helping us with a few instant polls. Um, when I um, uh, put a question to you in a minute um, and I say the poll is open, please would you use the buttons corresponding with the answers that you see on the screen? Uh, and here we go. We're going to try one. So uh, the polling is now open on the following question, which is, were you happy with the outcome of the arc? This is just a dry run. Don't worry, this isn't the welfare session, really. Can you vote now, please, by pressing one for yes or two for no? And you can see the timer on the right going down, so please vote now. Thank you. And we, as if by magic. <laughs> ah. A few plants in the audience, I think. <laughs> OK, good. Right, right, so the technology works. And we now just got four quick polls for you. Can we please have the first question? When it comes specifically, Brian, not Brexit, to welfare and horse racing, which statement best describes your view? And please use keys one to four. We are ahead of public sentiment on welfare. We are in tune with the majority of public sentiment on welfare. The disquiet on welfare is growing, and we must be seen to do more. Or we are in danger of losing our license to operate. The time to act is now. Please vote. You have 30 seconds, counting down on your right-hand side. If you make a mistake, there's a little bin button, and you can re-vote again. That's a long 30 seconds. Are we all there? OK, so as if by magic. Mm. So that's quite interesting. And that's something that uh, maybe that's the way we've set up this session, is leading the, leading the outcome. Uh, but that's quite an interesting set of results. Um, suggests that we all feel that. We need to deal with this issue. May we have the next question, please? OK, just this is one about education. And it, uh, it links a little bit to what uh, Paul Marie was saying just now. Uh, when it comes specifically to welfare and horse racing, which statement best describes your view? 
One, we have no need to do more than we have been doing to educate the public. Two, we do a pretty good job of educating the public about our sport. Three, our public has no idea about the efforts we go to on welfare. Uh, or four, unless we educate the public with compelling reasons to race horses, our sport is at risk. Please open the voting. Thank you. And please vote within 30 seconds on one of those four. And the results coming through now, oh, even more extreme in terms of what we need to do. Um, so the, the most riskier option has the highest vote. Now, Dr. Richard Heitner, who is uh, leading us later on uh, on our session, will be taking note of these because he's going to refer back to them. May we have the next question, please? We're going a little bit more specific now. The primary responsibility for facilitating the aftercare of racehorses lies with the owner and trainer, the racing authority, a charity or foundation, or others. Please open the voting. Thank you. Pretty clear what we think about that one. Very interesting again. I'm going to ask the panel what they think about these in a minute. Could we have the final question for now, please? Please let's open the voting. And the use of the whip in racing is more of a public perception problem than a genuine welfare issue. Yes or no? Please, uh, please open the voting. And the poll's about to close. Oh, 50-50 nearly, sort of. Well, a bit like the 50-50 in Brexit. <laughs> very good. Thank you very much for your, uh, your thoughts on that. Um, we've now got a short bit of time to just have a little bit of panel discussion and then possibly some questions and answers on what you've heard today. We will revisit those polls. Um, but just returning to our panel, who thank you again for the time that you've given. Um, Dr. Rick, any immediate thoughts on the results of the polling? Uh, actually, I thought they were pretty much in line with what I expected. Um, the uh, whip issue kind of surprised me because I thought it would have been a, considered a, more of a perception than a reality issue. Um, but, uh, you know, it's one thing to, to see a big stud horse... Uh, uh, jockey it after a big stud horse as compared to a, a little filly, but uh, uh, I, I think we recognize that we have to do something about whips. I think that's uh, pretty clear in the results. Paul Marie? Just a word on, on the use of the whip. Uh, the whip now with a padded whip, with the rule of racing, it's not a real challenge, a real problem of welfare. But the public perception is terrible. The, the, the problem for the public, they, they only look at the arrival of the race and then they see jockeys eating horses. And even if it is not painful for the horse, the image we give at this time is very detrimental. We must keep that in mind. 
it is detrimental to see people eating horses. Brian, any reflections on the polls? Um, two. One was the education thing, which I think was a, a very uh, interesting and uh, progressive result. Um, before we go out educating, uh, I, I would like to be in a position where we have good stories to tell, that um, we have our own house in order, and um, I think it's potentially dangerous to go out saying what a great job we're doing when some fundamentals need to be done better. So um, I think excellent with, with education and communication, and we have some many very good stories to tell, but I think we, uh, we have an obligation to be working very hard to get our house in order um, so that we, uh, we don't have sort of potential uh, weak areas that uh, can be um, uh, picked upon. Um, with regards to the whip, there's no question it's a really significant uh, perception problem. Um, in my sort of social or peer group or whatever, there are quite a few people I know who would, um, you know, they'd quite like to own a racehorse. Um, there's two things that come back. Uh, this is sort of in social conversations. One is always the whip. And it's not necessarily the man of the house or whatever that really would like to have a racehorse, but his family, his peer group, his friends, they get the how can you own a horse and be part of an industry where they thrash horses with a whip. Um, and the other is uh, is fatalities. And uh, those things are very significant to Terence, I think, to those people in the middle that, you know, potentially could be owners, could be very enthusiastic participants, but... Th um, they they are put off by those two uh, those two uh, issues, um, and uh, I, I think that's something we really need to look at. And certainly with injuries, we're working hard at that. Um, I don't actually uh, agree with whip uh, with Rick about the whip. I I think it's uh, more a minor irritant during the course of the race. It's an encouragement. It's a keep going, keep going message. Um, the question of whether there has been something that makes the horse respond to the whip in the past. That's been a noxious stimulant and they, they sort of recall that is, a, is sometimes problematic. But in the heat of the heat of the race, I don't think the whip itself is uh, particularly uh, cruel or, or painful. It's an encouragement, uh, especially with the modern whips. And I'd have to say what I saw yesterday uh, with the use of the whip uh, in French racing was something I was, um, I was personally very comfortable with. Thank you. Um, wh one of the things that, uh, we, you know, uh, Paul-Marie said, you know, don't focus always on pessimism and the problems. And one thing I would like to ask this panel, because you I haven't added up how many years you've had in uh, horse racing administration and uh, regulation and involvement, but I know it's considerable and you're eminent people. Could I ask each of you, starting with Brandt, um, what are the biggest positive changes, one or two changes that you've seen in the last 20 years that has showcased the good work that we've done in our sport? Look, Nick, I think um, <clears throat> for me, uh, actually, and it reflects on the polling results, uh, that the overwhelming majority of the people in this room have supported the notion that, that, that we should be responsible as owners or trainers for the, um, the, the aftercare of our racehorses. And, and, and as an industry, I think, you know, there's been a lot of fabulous work done over the last couple of decades on... on uh, you know, supporting charitable foundations and investing in, in aftercare. Um, the message that's come through loud and clear today is that I think we all, as people that have such a close connection with the industry, uh, do take responsibility to a certain extent personally for that. And I think um, that area of aftercare over the last 20 years, since I commenced my um, experience in, as an administrator in racing, has, it has really evolved so rapidly and I think the message that's coming through today is that perhaps there is much more work to be done and, and we need to take, when I say we, horse people, need to take responsibility for that um, because that's what, what our polling results are telling us. Thank you. Paul-Marie? I think four, four years ago, our chairman, Eduardo Rothschild, signed the chart, the welfare chart, with the other part of the industry, the horse industry in France, the equestrian sport. After this sign of this important time, we built guidelines on welfare issue. 
150 pages of advice for the industry, for the stakeholder. And it has been translated in English if you want to have a look. And then, three years ago, we put a form in order to check the welfare issue in each training yard we visit every year for the training control. That means every year, 250 yards. And I'm very happy to see that the result is globally very good. We, we have a good, uh, a good welfare statement, a good welfare uh, organization, and the, the trainer and the owner and the breeding and the breeders also are very sensible to, to uh, or sensitive to, to the issue. So we are very happy of this progress and to see and to be able to show to the public that we keep under control the welfare issue. Thank you. Rick, what's the biggest thing you've seen, the biggest improvement in the last 20 years? Well, I, there's actually two areas. The aftercare change has been uh, very important. In California, we actually have a program called Karma where uh, owners are 0.3% uh, 0, 0 of the purse is actually deducted uh, and uh, it's, you can opt out and 80% of the people uh, continue to, to uh, uh, have that taken out of their purses. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of focus on aftercare. But one thing that, that we've done is the improvement in our understanding of track surfaces, exactly how big the problem is with fatalities, improvements in drug testing, medication regulations, the problem is that, that uh, we've had a hard time uh, explaining that to uh, animal rights activists and the public, uh, who f quite frankly are, are very unethical in the way that they attack horse racing. They don't really care about the truth, uh, and uh, we just are, have always been behind trying to catch up in, in the public relations aspect of welfare. So everything we've done has, has improved the condition of horses. Uh, and it's been an ongoing process, uh, particularly from my aspect in veterinary medicine, of, of taking better care of horses. Thank you. And lastly, Brian, your thoughts? Um, the other members have covered a lot of important points, but one I would like to add is uh, I think over the past 20 years, we've actually... Uh, I think there's a, a real possibility that we do not have to accept fatal injuries as an inevitable consequence of, of flat racing. There will always be accidents, there will always be some problems, but I think with better understanding of uh, bone tissue and how it adapts to exercise and um, perhaps a, uh, a, a sometimes we talk about training from the office, but I, I do think that... Um, it's a more scientific approach or a better means of monitoring horses in training so that we are able to identify signs of when they're not quite coping with the training and perhaps uh, you know, going back 50 years or more where horses were given plenty of time to be conditioned and adapt to the stresses of racing, that we end up with, uh, with stronger, better athletes that are much less likely to, to suffer uh, fatal injuries in racing. 20 years ago, I'd have probably laughed at you if, uh, someone, if I'd been told that, but now I think there's a, a real possibility that we can make significant progress on that. Thank you very much. Um, we're running a little short of time. We're going to go for a break shortly, but I wondered if anyone wanted to ask any questions of any of our panellists um, based on what you've heard this morning. Please. Very short question. Dr. Rick, after you referred to the correct use of the whip that you are investigating in Santa Anita, can you describe what that means? Yes. Well, the, the, what, what they've done in California is you, the jockey gets three strikes and needs a, the horse needs an opportunity to respond. The biggest change has been easier because it's been able to be done by the race racetrack itself, Santa Anita, and that is the pro prohibition of the use of the whip during training except for uh, correction and safety reasons. And they're looking at other ways to, you know, looking at the construction of the whip and all those uh, aspects as well, even though we do have a, 
a what is is a cushioned whip. There's always a debate as to whether you should have three uh, strikes and then give an opportunity to the horse to respond, or whether you have seven total or whatever it would be. I think it's a real challenge for horse racing to try to determine uh, what's the right way to go. But uh, any the the stewards are enforcing whip regulations very aggressively, which have already been in place, which which is a difference. And the whip is not in, allowed to be used for encouragement during training. We have time for one more question for any of our panelists. There's one here, please. Thank you, Nick. Des Layden from the International Thoroughbred Breeders Federation. Chairman, in any debate on welfare, we are always inevitably on the back foot because our assailants use the word welfare in their title. Our titles are those of racing club, racing authority. And to quote from a young lady from your own island, not everybody will be familiar with her, but she used an immortal phrase. You would say that, wouldn't you? In the International Thoroughbred Breeders Federation, we are giving serious thought to the inclusion of a strap line under our title to try to give us some moral high ground when we are the subject of an assault by the wealthy. And our thinking, which I would advocate to this room, Chairman, with your permission, is that we are de facto an alliance. We are the guardians of the thoroughbred racehorse. We know more about them than anybody else does, particularly our critics, and we nurture them from the cradle increasingly towards the grave, and we should champion our role as guardians. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, we are going to, uh, it's been a fascinating session. I'm sure we'll return to that concept um, in the next session, which is more an outward um, uh, perspective on our sport with Dr. Richard Heitner. Thank, I'd just like to say, uh, before we split for five minute comfort break, the chairman is saying, I'm sorry we've overrun. Just to say thank you very much to panel members, to Dr. Brian, to Brandt, to Paul Marie and Rick. Thank you.